Okay, today we're talking about motivation. Uh, it's kind of an interesting chapter, uh, kind of a, a str strange PowerPoint slides. Uh, so yeah, today we're talking about motivation. Uh, Self-enhancement is the motivation to view oneself positively. Research reveals that people apparently have a strong need to view themselves in a positive light. Uh, we lie to ourselves. Uh, we tell ourselves stories uh, in order to make ourselves feel better. And this is uh, self-enhancement. This is self-esteem. Self-esteem is the positivity of your overall evaluation of yourself. And probably you have a pretty, hopefully you have a pretty good idea of who you are and how you feel about yourself. In a study done in Canada in 1999, Heine who, and colleagues, uh, Heine, of course, is the author of your text, uh, found that 93% of European Canadians had uh, self-esteem scores that were above the midpoint of the scale. Uh, Self-serving biases are tendencies for people to exaggerate how good they think they are. Uh, a good example is, is Donald Trump. He always speaks in hyperbole. Everything is the best. He talks about the economy being the best it's ever been. Well, the reality is that the economy isn't the best it's ever been, and it's not the most rapid growth that we've ever seen in the United States, but he does speak in hyperbole, and most people will, uh, will uh, excuse him for his hyperbole, as interesting as that is. But the reality is, of course, there and there are realities out there. The reality is it's not the strongest that it's ever been. Uh, Obama's recovery was much was much stronger than uh, than Trump's recovery, despite all the things that Trump has done. And of course, th these are self-serving biases. Everything that he does is the best. It's the it's the nicest. He's the only one that can do this. Uh, and now, of course, he is suffering from COVID nineteen. So we'll see how this all plays out. A downward social comparison is when we compare ourselves to someone who is worse off than us. Uh, we are seeking to form a favorable comparison that casts our own performance in a positive light. When a setback occurs, the individual can focus on and perhaps exaggerate how good they are at something unrelated to their setback, compensating for the pain of failure. They can self-enhance by recru recruiting other kinds of positive thoughts. And here we have a, a, a gentleman doing one-arm push-ups and uh, solving a uh, rubric, Rubik's Cube. Is that a Rubik's Cube? Yeah, it's a Rubik's Cube. Anyway, uh, so it would be interesting to find out why, why he's doing this if he has had some kind of a failure lately. Discounting is reduced uh, is reducing the perceived importance of the do domain in which an individual performed badly. People might attribute the uh, cause of their actions to something outside themselves, external attribution, in contrast to an internal attribution where they see the cause as within themselves. I don't know if you remember the 2016 election, uh, but after the election, uh, it was despite the fact that Donald Trump won, he actually lost the popular vote by over almost three million votes. And in order, uh, in order for him to feel better about his victory, one of the things he said was that between three to five million votes were cast illegally uh, by illegal immigrants and whatnot. Uh, so he was trying to make himself feel better, and that was external uh, attribution. The reason he didn't he didn't uh, win the popular vote was because the other side cheated. And he's already said that about this election. He said that the only way that he can lose is if somebody cheats, uh, without any proof, without any ideas about what's going to happen in the election. So uh, really kind of interesting. He's a, he's a study in contrast. Some people dissipate their personal failures by basking in the reflected glory of a successful group they identify with. And in, ca in the case over here, these guys identify with uh, their football team, the Screaming Eagles, I'm guessing. Uh, I, and I don't know exactly what group that is. <laughs> Research seems to show that European Americans, even at a young age, tend to maintain fairly high self-enhancing motivations. And we're going to find out why uh, in, uh, at, uh, by the end of the chapter. Trop and Wright in 2003 found that 
that uh, preschool and elementary school European American children chose self-enhancing images at 92% compared to a similar group of Mexican American students at 82%. So as we can see, European American uh, students uh, are looking for positive uh, self-enhancing uh, feelings. When Freiburg and Marcus in 2003 looked at a group of elementary school Native Americans, they found that less than half made positive statements about themselves. The authors saw these results as consistent with the understanding that Native Americans are less independent and independence is related to self-enhancement. And of course, I don't know if you agree with that or not, but they they had a difficult time finding, uh, saying things that were positive about themselves. Uh, this did not prove true of the collectivistic Maori of, of New Zealand. Uh, this is a study done by Harrington and Liu in, in uh, 2002. This did not prove true of African Americans. Major Spencer Schmader, uh, Wolf and Crocker in 1998 did the, the uh, research. Uh, this did not prove true of Israeli Druze. Uh, this is according to Kerman in 2001. If you're wondering who the Druze are, the Druze are a uh, religious group that are kind of somewhere between uh, the Muslim religion and the Jewish religion, as curious as that is. Uh, they are a minority, as well, they are a minority in, in Israel, but they are the Druze. Uh, really fascinating uh, people. This is not proved true of Asian Indians, uh, according to a study by Joshi and Carter in 2013. 93% uh, of European Canadians have high self-esteem, and this is according to Heine, your author, uh, et al. in 1999. <clears throat> the European Canadians. 55% of Japanese Canadians have high self-esteem, and this is according to Heine, et al. in 1999. And as I told you before, uh, Heine's wife is Japanese, and he met her when he was uh, teaching uh, English over in Japan, and uh, now she lives with him in in, uh, in Vancouver. Vancouver. Masses of research show that Americans find success more memorable, probably because they think more about them, and Japanese tend to find failures more memorable because they think more about those. And that's according to Hamama, Hama, Hamamura and Heine in 2007, Kiriyama and Mat, uh, Matsumoto and Noras Kunkit in 1997. After failing at a task, North Americans tend to discount the importance of the task. Japanese will view the task as even more important. Americans tend to bask in the reflected glory of their sports teams, while the Japanese are more likely to be critical of their local team as the opposition. And, of course, that's the way the Japanese mindset is. So if you were a fan of, uh, of the, uh, the Arizona Diamondbacks uh, and you went to a game and they weren't playing very well, you would, you would boo them. Uh, that's uh, pretty much what happens in Philadelphia. They're pretty mean to their sports teams. Heine and others have speculated that East Asians are just as motivated as Westerners to evaluate themselves positively, merely as their group selves instead of their individual selves. Uh, East Asians like themselves as much as Westerners, but seem to be more self-critical of their competence. One of the phenomena of Craigslist and eBay is the endowment effect. Westerners tend to value something more after they, they own it, which makes them inflate the prices they're asking for their junk. As you can see, this little girl selling lemonade for five cents a, a, a glass, and she's asking $100 million for her business. Why? Because she has worked at it. Our growth rate supports the valuation. We see the opposite effect of East Asians when they when they value some or when they uh, are selling something uh, they they undervalue it rather than uh, overvalue it. Miller and her colleagues, 1997, and then again in 2002, looked at children's stories in the United States and Taiwan. They found a marked difference. American stories focused on the children's attention on their strengths, while Taiwanese stories focused on areas that needed correcting. 
European American parents viewed self-esteem as central to child rearing. This is one of the reasons why you see this even in kindergarten uh, students. Uh, they, they have very high regard for themselves. Ta Taiwanese parents express the belief that too much self-esteem can lead to frustration when things aren't working out well for the children. And of course, so they teach their children differently than we do, than European Americans do in the United States. Research shows that the notion of individual cells didn't emerge in Western literature until the 12th century. This is kind of fascinating. At this point, the Christian concept of the Last Judgment changed from being an issue of the salvation of collectives to the salvation of individual souls. Now, the reason this is important is because in the 12th century, there was, a, there was all kinds of, of upheavals going on in, in the churches of Europe. Uh, one of the things that happened was uh, the Great Schism occurred in 1054. Uh, it began in 1054. Uh, that that was there was only one Christian church in Europe, and then all of a sudden uh, the uh, the group the group group in the East and the group in the West uh, dis began disagreeing with one another, and they they decided uh, that they needed to split, and that's what the Great Schism is. And of course, Eastern Orthodox uh, Church is uh, is different from the uh, from the Catholic Church, the, from the Roman Catholic Church. And it's at that stage that the Roman Catholic Church became the Roman Catholic Church. And it's at that stage that the uh, Orthodox Church became the Orthodox Church. Now, probably if you you live in the United States, you you may not have even heard of the Orthodox Church. Uh, there's Greek Orthodox, there's Serbian Orthodox, there's Russian Orthodox. Um, it's, it's actually quite large, uh, but it uh, just encompasses Eastern Europe, uh, st starting at Greece. And the, the head of the uh, Eastern Orthodox Church is uh, in Greece, as interesting as that is. Now, the other question you might have is, now why in the world did they switch from, uh, from the individual to... Uh, why did they switch from the group to the individual? And the answer to that is that uh, the Christian church uh, in the very beginning was more communal than it is today. So if you lived in a village that was Christian, uh, everybody in the, in the uh, village was Christian. And if somebody wasn't Christian, then they, they weren't in that village. Um, uh, the uh, Christian church was a minority for an extended length of time. Uh, there was an argue, argument going on as to uh, whether uh, Jesus was a born a god or whether he became a god or whether it was something in between. And this was a huge argument. Um, it caused all kinds of rifts in the, in the Christian church. Uh, and they, they would shift from one uh, idea to the other. And one of the things that happened uh, to the uh, to the Christian Church at the time was they were they had to decide they had to determine what what books were going to go into the Bible and uh, then they had to decide uh, how they were going to portray Jesus and the other thing that they had to decide was who killed Jesus um, obviously the the Romans were the ones that crucified him. Uh, but somehow they came up with the rationale that uh, that Jewish people uh, were the ones that killed Jesus. And to this day, that is the mindset, uh, if you've ever tried to talk to somebody about it, uh, somebody who's very religious, uh, this isn't even an argument uh, that uh, Jesus was, uh, was killed by the Jews rather than the Romans. Now, if it was the Romans, that makes it kind of tough because... Uh, if, if your mindset is that the Romans killed Jesus, then, of course, uh, the head of the, uh, the Catholic Church is in Rome, and this makes it very difficult uh, for you to rationalize uh, Rome becoming so important. Uh, so it, it, gets, it gets really interesting and, and it gets really weird. Now we're going to talk about uh, the difference between the Catholic Church and the uh, Protestants. With the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century, uh, in the 16th, that's, that's when uh, Martin Luther decided that uh, the, the Catholic Church was too tainted and he needed to, uh, he needed to reform it. So what he did 
Uh, and the reason they called them Protestants was because they were protesting against the way the Catholic Church was being run, and hence they they uh, uh, were given the name Protestants, which has stuck. I mean, it's the this is a a movement that is it has uh, been very strong uh, up up to the 21st century, uh, yet it's still referred to as the the Protestants. The Protestant Reformation. It would be like the British calling, uh, calling the United States the revolutionary uh, country, uh, but that's just the way uh, religion kind of works. Uh, with the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century, many Protestant sects maintained a belief in predestination or the idea that one's fate was determined before your birth. This gave people a great drive to enhance themselves as that proved that they were one of God's chosen people. Now, if, you, if, if you've been watching uh, how the taxes, how they changed the tax code uh, so that uh, wealthy people become even, they're taxed even less, and they, uh, they get to keep a much, much more of their money, n now all of this makes a lot of sense because the United States is primarily a Protestant country. Um, so this idea that, that, uh, that if you have money, then you should be able to keep the money and you, you should be able to uh, accumulate as much as you possibly can. So the whole idea of, of Donald Trump uh, only uh, paying $750 in taxes in 2016 and 2017, as far as the Protestant idea is, uh, as far as uh, most of the individuals who are very, very wealthy are concerned. That's the way it should be, because they pay other taxes, of course. Uh, they, you know, they don't. They, other than federal income tax, and because of that, of course, they rationalize the fact that uh, the wealthier you are, the fewer taxes that you pay. Face, and so uh, we're going to talk about this later uh, when we talk about the the Protestant work ethic. Face is a strong Eastern idea that barely registers among Westerners. Face has been defined as the amount of social value others give, uh, give you if you uh, live up to the, the standards associated with your position. The higher your social position, the greater the amount of face uh, available to you. If others grant you face, you'll enjoy all the prerequisites that come with the enhanced status and power. One characteristic of face is that it's more easily lost than gained. The amount of face an individual has has access to is determined by position, uh, thus increasing face can only be increased with promotion. Now we're talking about something that, that people have a very uh, difficult time understanding, uh, face. This is especially difficult to understand in, uh, in the Western world. But in Asia, of course, the face is, is the most important thing because that is your social, social status. And you get uh, that social status only by increasing uh, the, your position. Uh, so that it has to do with promotion. While face is difficult to enhance, face is lost whenever individuals fail to live up to the standards of their roles. Face is always vulnerable, and because others determine a person's face, people must count on the goodwill of others to be able to maintain their face. Now, this is really important, and the reason it's so important is because you're allowing everybody else to define you in Asia. But they are collective. Most Asian countries, all Asian co countries, are collectivist countries, so the group is able to control you and it's able to define you by how much face they give, it gives you. Since face is so easily lost, one strategy is for people to adopt a cautious approach and try to ensure that they are not acting in a way that might lead others to reject them. This approach is known as prevention orientation, being defensive and, and cautious. So you're not willing to do things. You're not willing to take a chance. Uh, and Asians uh, have that uh, have that proclivity. They don't want to take a chance because they're afraid they'll lose face. Prevention orientation is contrasted with promotion orientation, where the individual is more concerned with advancing themselves and aspiring for gains. Prevention seeks to avoid bad things, while promotion seeks to secure good things. 
Canadian and Japanese participants were given a faux test that they all failed. They were given a chance to either work on their problems or focus on their successes in the test. Canadian participants chose to focus on the things that they did well, promotion focus. In the same study, the Japanese participants maintained a more prevention focus. They were more interested in working on things they did poorly, apparently so they could improve themselves and be less likely to fail in the future. This self-improvement motivation, a desire to seek out potential weaknesses and work on correcting them, is strong motivation in East Asian contexts. So this is something that you need to remember. Uh, when you're dealing with Asians, face is extremely important, and they are uh, continually trying to maintain face. Eastern and Western cultures deal with strengths and weaknesses differently. East Asian parents are more likely to call their children's attention to their weaknesses. Western parents direct their children's attention to their strengths. As East Asians have increased their fortunes, they have become big consumers of brand name luxury uh, goods. Focus purchasing and displaying brand name goods can increase their face. They, uh, they, a key motivation for the, these acquisitions is to achieve social recognition. Okay, uh, let me take a drink and then we'll, <laughs> we'll tackle uh, Max Weber. and Karl Marx. He's on the next page. 1904-1905, Max Weber, a, a sociologist, printed a, a controversial but influential series of essays entitled The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. Weber attempted to determine how capitalism was able to emerge from the traditional economics of medieval Europe. Before Weber, the prime social idea came from Karl Marx. Now, both Weber and Marx were Germans, uh, so this came out of a Germany that actually wasn't a country yet. Uh, it, was, it was just a bunch of, of principalities. But the, uh, that area of the world uh, influenced a great deal of what was going on in Europe. Marx felt that capitalism was a result of surplus capital that came from the shift from an agricultural economy to an industrial economy. Marx also felt that religion was being used by governments to control the people. Weber viewed capitalism as the product of people's de deriving meaning from a particular cultural context. Capitalism grew out of a belief system that was rooted in a number of cultural ideas that began emerging in the 16th and 17th centuries in Western Europe and in North America. The ideas that became the foundation for capitalism were ones that grew out of the Protestant Reformation. You remember the Protestant Reformation. Protestants emphasized literary, uh, literacy training more than Catholics so that people would be able to read the Bible for themselves. Uh, it wasn't just that. Uh, Protestant religion uh, printed their Bibles in the language of the people that uh, were going to the church. Uh, the Catholics at this time, all of their uh, religious writings, all of their um, their mass was uh, and mass, all their dogmas uh, were in Latin. So most of the people not only was it not in a language that they could read, but it wasn't in a language that they could even understand. Uh, and th it was this way in the Catholic Church until the 1960s. Uh, mass and everything else was, was, everything was conducted in Latin, as weird as that may seem. Uh, in today's society, of course, the, the Catholic uh, uh, Mass is, uh, is spoken in, in whatever language is, is the local language. But uh, through 1960, from, from zero to 1960, it was all in, well, not at zero. Zero was <laughs> When Jesus was born, and he he did certainly didn't speak uh, uh, didn't speak Latin. He spoke Aramaic, uh, which is a Middle Eastern language. 
Uh, but now you can understand since since everything was was in Latin. Now you can understand why uh, a the decision had to be made as to whose fault it was that Jesus was killed. Uh, if if it was the Romans' fault, uh, speaking in Latin would have been probably one of the things they wouldn't want to do. And of course, uh, since the uh, headquarters of the of the church was in Rome, uh, it was necessary uh, for the uh, for the church to decide uh, who were the bad guys and, and who were the good guys. As it turned out, the Romans uh, the Romans were the good guys, and the uh, Jewish people were the were the bad guys. It was easier that way since their headquarters was in Rome. Uh, they they would probably have uh, alienated uh, the uh, mo most of the people of of the uh, of the uh, of the Roman Empire. The industrialized relation that formed between each person and God has been argued to be central to the blossoming of individualism that emerged during the Reformation and continues to influence much of Western society today. Martin Luther, the founder of Protestantism, proposed that each individual had a calling, that is, a unique God-given purpose to fulfill during his or her moral uh, mortal existence, and of course, you guys are going to college. You've got the, you've got plans, you've got goals. Uh, you could refer to that as your calling, and maybe it, it's going to turn out to be your life's work. Uh, and if you were, if you were uh, a Lutheran or if you were a Protestant, uh, you would probably refer to that as your calling. I have a calling to do this. Uh, I, I will do anything to be able to do this. Uh, my calling seems to be teaching. Your calling, I'm not sure what your calling may be. But it's up to you to figure it out. The idea, of course, you don't have to be Protestant to, to feel like you have a calling. I'm not Protestant myself, uh, yet uh, I feel that uh, I am in the uh, right job for, <laughs> for me. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Uh, the idea was that we are all God's servants in the world and that we are each uh, given a specific uh, duty or job to take care of uh, while we tend the planet. God gives each individual the unique skills and capabilities uh, needed to fulfill their calling, and it is incumbent upon individuals to discover their calling. The highest uh, moral duty that individuals uh, were believed to have was to serve God well by working hard at their calling. Luther was able to imbue daily labor with a spiritual significance that had traditionally been reserved for religious activities such as prayer and ritual. You've got to understand that uh, that the Dark Ages in Europe, the reason they were so dark is because the church was telling people that um, in order for them to go to heaven, uh, they needed to uh, adhere to all the religious principles, uh, and prayer and ritual were the were the main things that people could were supposed to think about. They weren't supposed to think about science. They weren't supposed to think about mathematics. They weren't supposed to think about uh, sex. They were only supposed to think about prayer and ritual. Uh, they were only supposed to have sex uh, for procreation. Uh, so there was no uh, there was no having sex. Unless it was, there was a possibility of the uh, of the woman becoming uh, impregnated. Now, as you can imagine, that, that this seems like a fairly <laughs> a fairly dark world, uh, and of course, it, it kind of was because everything that uh, the only way to go to heaven would be for you to be religiously astute. In other, and and that was in everything. You couldn't. There was no. There were no. Uh, novels being written there there was nothing other than religion and and survival that was it uh, as weird as that may seem but th this was what but one of the things that was going on of course uh, in the the 15th and the 14th and the, and the 13th and 12th centuries the dark ages as we, we call them science wasn't even allowed and of course we we have people today that deny uh, science as being important uh, and one of the reasons they do that is because they say that uh, 
that religion is far more important. Faith is far more important than knowledge. Uh, we kind of have a, a president that, that doesn't believe in science. As strange as that, that seems strange to me. Because Protestants came to uh, view work as, as a spiritual task, they wished to avoid debasing it by holding a casual or unprofessional attitude. Protestants felt that people should take their work very seriously. Uh, let me give you an example of what happened to me yesterday. Uh, you know, we had the derecho, and a lot of limbs fell out of trees. Uh, well, most of them, we well, all of them, we've cut up by this time. We've, uh, but uh, they were. It was all piled in our in our uh, in our yard. A uh, huge pile. Uh, it's probably ten feet tall, and it was probably twenty feet around. But that was just one of the piles. We had three piles, four piles, like uh, very similar to that. So we had all this wood, and of course, all of it had been alive. Uh, so none of it was dried, and it wouldn't burn. We couldn't get it to burn. Uh, so what do you do with uh, you know a pile of wood that's that big? Well, uh, that was uh, that was about six or seven weeks ago that the derecho hit. That was longer. This is like two months ago. Anyway, uh, yesterday uh, it's been rainy. It's been windy. Uh, we couldn't burn anything. So yesterday we uh, I I. Yesterday was, was calm, uh, and it was fairly sunny. So I went outside, uh, and I uh, lit some of our trash, put some of our trash uh, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the pile of wood. And it lit it, but it didn't, it didn't burn real strong. It wasn't a really strong burn. But eventually, of course, it caught the whole thing on fire. It had dried out enough so that things were burning. Uh, there was enough dried wood in there to, to keep things going. Uh, so we actually burned up all of our piles. Now, the weird part was that uh, that's fairly labor-intensive, uh, maintaining the fire, uh, picking up uh, that we had actually had three piles. They were fairly close to each other, but uh, we had to... <laughs> So what I had to do was pick up uh, each limb and throw it, throw it onto the fire uh, to keep the fire going. And we were able to burn all of the wood uh, yesterday, but this it took about six or seven hours. Now the reality is, my wife always always says, "Well, it's time to quit." Uh, but uh, I wanted to get the thing done. That's me, me and my Protestant work ethic. Uh, so we did, and I was tired. I was really, really tired, and I was sweaty, and I, you know, it was. Uh, uh, I had all that smoke in my face and in, on my clothes, and and uh, you know I could have quit lots of times, but I wanted to get the thing done. Why in the world would I would I continue this? Why not just you know save it for tomorrow? Uh, but uh, it, it's my the the idea of the Protestant work ethic that made me going until we finished everything up. My wife actually came out and helped. Uh, and she was upset with me that I wouldn't stop because she didn't want to stop until I stopped. She kept trying to talk me into to stopping at various points during the during the thing. But I, you know, I finished up. We we finished the whole pile up, and then later I went out and uh, I raked uh, some of the leaves that had fallen off the, the limbs and threw it on the pile, and all the leaves are gone. So it, my, our our yard is clean now because we. Uh, because we burned the, the trash pile. Uh, it was believed that God would not reward those who were doomed to burn in hell, so any sign of material success was perceived as evidence that one was one of the elect. Now, when we talk about being one of the elect, are we talking about all the billionaires in the United States, all the millionaires in the United States? Are these individuals uh, selected by God to be wealthy? The answer is, as far if they're Protestant, they probably think so. They they feel like they deserve it, and this is one of the reasons why there has been such a movement in the Republican Party to change the tax laws so these people could keep more of their money. It's part of the the the, the Protestant. Protestant idea of capitalism. Any accumulated wealth was to be reinvested to further one's efforts and to accumulate even more wealth and evidence of one's status among the elect. If, if you think that this is uh, 
just a story that uh, that uh, Heine came up with. You're you're incorrect. The this Protestant work ethic, even if they're not Protestant, they still have this idea that they deserve all the money that they have, and they want to keep as much as they can to prove that they should go to heaven. Now, one of the the richest woman in the world is the lady that just divorced uh, Jeff Bezos, the guy that owns Amazon. He's the richest, I think he's the richest man in the world. Well, he was. Now now she's got half of all of his money, and she's giving his money, he's, she's giving her money away, uh, which is kind of interesting. So does she have the same feeling that Jeff Bezos does, that he deserves all this money? And the answer is no, because she's, she's giving a lot of the money away. Modern capitalism, as Weber viewed it, uh, was thus concerned with the accumulation of wealth for its own sake and not for the sake of material pleasures that it brought. So the idea is, if you're wealthy, then you need to uh, you need to accumulate as much wealth as you have, but you're not supposed to have a good time, uh, which goes against uh, people's ideas. They think that you accumulate wealth in order to have a good life. Or have a good time. So this gets a little weird because uh, when we're talking about, uh, if, if you remember Jeffrey Epstein, he was the one that was uh, seducing underage girls, uh, and there were, you know, Prince Andrew theoretically uh, was one of the individuals uh, that would party with uh, with him, as well as uh, uh, I guess there's a story that Bill Clinton is another individual that has partied with Jeffrey Epstein. Um, we won't ever find out from Jeffrey Epstein that because he committed suicide in prison. Um, but it's really kind of curious uh, that uh, some people have this idea and some people don't. They think that uh, money is is uh, for the uh, material pleasures that you can that you can do that you can have, I guess. Uh, a, a, a recent analysis found that Protestants and people living in Protestant societies more generally consider the prospect of being unemployed as more of a blow to their well-being than non-Protestants living in non-Protestant societies do. And this is according to research done by Van Hoom and Maisland in 2013. In the early 21st century, a study revealed that Protestant nations were far more industrialized than their Catholic counterparts, and religious differences accounted for much of that. And that's according to Cavill, Conte, Parente, and Zhao in 2007. A degree of individualism exists in Protestant countries compared to other countries. The six most individualistic countries in the world are largely Protestant, whereas the least individualistic Western societies are largely Catholic. So the six most individualistic countries are Protestant, and the, uh, the least individualistic are, are Catholic. Countries dominated by various Asian religions also tend to score low in individualism. And these are the Asian countries. There's a large chunk of uh, countries that are, are Muslim. Uh, the largest, uh, the most populous one is Indonesia, is a pop is uh, pro is uh, Islam, and then of course the Chinese are Confucian, Taoism, and Buddhism. The Japanese are Shinto Buddhist. Uh, India is Hindu, uh, and, and there's various types of uh, Buddhism that uh, we see here. How many countries are Christian? The only one is uh, Taiwan and the Philippines. That's interesting. I guess it's not that interesting, is it? <clears throat> the Philippines, of course, were owned by Spain for an extended length of time. And then, of course, the United States defeated Spain in the Spanish-American War in uh, the turn of the 20th century. And we controlled the Philippines until World War II, and the Japanese took it over, and we gave them independence right after World War II. Pronounced differences in embracing an in intrinsic uh, work ethic were observed between Western European Catholics and mainstream Protestants as evident in a measure of work values, Georgie and according to Georgie and Marsh in 1990. 
The Protestant ethic has been associated with negative attitudes toward laziness and being overweight, and this is according to Quinn and Crocker in 1999. McClellan in 1961 found that Protestant parents expected their children to become self-reliant at an earlier age compared with Catholic parents. And of course, I was raised in a Protestant community, uh, so one of the things that my parents tried to do was uh, kick us out of the house as soon as we were done with high school. Uh, we all went away to college. Some of it, most of us went away to college. Or we went into the army. I guess I, my, I have a brother that whose draft number was number one. And uh, as soon as he graduated from high school, he went into the army. He was a combat engineer, served in Vietnam. McClelland in 1961 investigated the stories written by all, actually all four of us uh, served during the Vietnam War. So, uh, and my dad, my dad was in the army at the same time. So all five of us were in the, the army at the same time. McClelland in 1961 investigated the stories written by young boys and found that those written by German Protestants had more evidence of strong achievement motivations than those written by German Catholics. Now, Germany is kind of a curious place because uh, during World War II, um, a lot of German cities were destroyed. A lot of them were bombed out of existence. Uh, and then when they rebuilt the, uh, uh, they rebuilt the towns, um, Germany has two uh, state religions. One of them is the Protestant church and the other is the Catholic church. So if you look at a relatively large principality, a, a large city or a large town in Germany, you'll see two churches. Uh, and they're both sanctioned by the, uh, they're both sanctioned by the government. Uh, one will be the Protestant church at one end of the town, and the other will be the Catholic church at the other, usually at the other end of town. These two are fairly close to each other. Uh, this is the Protestant church, you can tell, because Lutherans like to build high steeples to be close to heaven, and Catholics, uh, they sometimes they have steeples, but not always. Uh, anyway, you can tell which one is wh which, one is which because the, the taller steeple. If uh, the Catholic Church had a steeple on it, this one would have to be taller. The Lutheran Church would have to be taller, as curious as that is. Like I said, in most uh, German towns, uh, the Lutheran Church is at one end of town, and the Catholic Church is at the other end of town. Um, at least it was that way when I was there in, uh, in the late 70s, early 80s. And then again, uh, my daughter was stationed in... Uh, in Germany in uh, 1990, in the 1990s. And we saw the same thing. Of course, it wasn't that long after we had been there. Ullman, Tenenbaum, and Barg uh, in 2011 primed a group of Americans in, and group of Canadians with salvation words or neutral words and then gave them a task to do. So they, they gave them either salvation words, I'm not sure what those salvation words would be, and then they gave them neutral words, and then they gave them something to do. Americans who were primed with salvation words worked harder on the task than those who were primed with neutral words. Now, remember, the United States has, uh, we are free to, to worship any way that we want. Now, most Americans worship in one way or the other. Uh, most Americans do believe in a religion. Uh, so Americans are primed to think and to do things in a religious manner. Uh, Canada, on the other hand, has a state religion. Their religion is the Anglican Church. Uh, there are Catholics that live in, in there are people of, of all different faiths in Canada, but uh, in essence, they have a state religion, and that is the Anglican Church or the Episcopalian Church in the United States, except they call it the Anglican Church up in Canada. So as Americans, a lot of our, as you saw before, uh, the uh, uh, German Protestants um, ha were using motivational words, salvation words. You know, these become part of the uh, fabric of the country. And anyway, so this is what happened. And so we'll see what, how it turns out. The American results indicate that notions of hard work and salvation are implicitly linked for Americans. 
This pattern occurred regardless of whether or not the American participants were religious, providing some evidence for what Weber's claim that ideas about predestination become secularized and thus part of the American cultural fabric. This is, this is a reality. Uh, whether you are religious or not, you can be the biggest atheist in the world, but our literature, the things that, the things that we talk about, all the uh, this idea of predestination has become secularized. So, despite the fact that you're not religious, you still have these ideas. If you live in the United States, it has it's in all of our literature. Uh, the American Dream. It's 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 uh, the concept of predestination. The concept that the harder you work, that uh, the more you will succeed, the more likely that you will, will succeed. That's the way it is in the United States. But remember, the United States is different from Canada. The Canadians have their own religion, have a, a government religion. The Canadian participants did not work any harder when primed with ideas about salvation, suggesting that an implicit link between salvation and work was not evident, despite the fact that they're Anglican. And Anglican, the Anglican Church is a Protestant church. Cohn, Kim, and Hudson in 2014 induced male uh, American Protestant Jews and Catholics to imagine their sisters in sexual situations. They then had them do sculptures. I know this sounds like a weird, weird experiment, but the idea was that uh, the, uh, Protestants, Jews, and Catholics will have a different uh, impetus to do things. Uh, they had them think of uh, their sisters in a sexual situation. The Protestants were judged as working harder on their sculptures than the Jews or the Catholics, or the Protestants not primed with depravity about their sisters. The researchers concluded that it was the depraved thoughts that induced the Protestants to work harder. They were punishing themselves, and they needed to be closer to God, and the only way to be closer to God was to work as hard as you possibly could. Now, that's the way the Protestants felt, but Jews and Catholics don't have the same concept. And, of course, the Protestants that weren't primed with the idea that their sister was having sex with somebody... Uh, they they didn't have these evil thoughts in their minds, so they didn't work harder. But the ones with the, these depraved thoughts were the Protestants who worked the hardest on their sculptures uh, in order to make themselves uh, more holy, I guess. We can see the world is fixed and beyond our control to change the entity uh, theory of the world, or we can think of the world as flexible and responsive to our efforts to change it, an incremental theory of the world. Uh, Rothbaum, Weiss, and Snyder in 1982 proposed that there are two ways to gain control of your life. People achieve a sense of primary control by striving to shape existing realities to fit their perceptions, goals, or wishes. Primary control also goes under the related name, internal locus of control, influence, and agency. People achieve a sense of secondary control when they attempt to align themselves with existing realities, leaving the realities unchanged but exerting control over the psychological impact of these realities. Secondary control, also known as adjustment, is, is related to the construct of an external locus of control. Your desires and goals adjust themselves to what your environment is most likely to provide. Weiss, Rothbaum, and Blackburn in 1984 see many socializing experiences in Japan that lead the Japanese to be more comfortable with engaging in secondary control strategies. Japanese infants spend more, uh, much more time in contact with their mothers and thus learn to adjust themselves to what their mothers are doing. Japanese workers change jobs uh, far less frequently than their Western counterparts, and it is not uncommon for workers to be promised lifetime employment, a system ensuring that employees learn to adjust themselves to whatever demands the company places on them. In a Japanese and American study where workers were asked to recount when they had been helped and when they had helped others, the Americans were better able to recall when they had influenced others. And this is according to a research by Morling, Kiriyama and Miyamoto in 2002. The Japanese recalled far more times when they were assisted 
than when they help someone else. There is, there is little emphasis on making choices in life for people from India. Making choices seems to be more difficult for Indians than for Americans. Indians take significantly more time to make choices than do Americans. And this is according to Savani, Marcus, and Connor in 2008. Asian Indians don't respond as negatively when they are deprived of the opportunity to choose when compared with Americans. Asian Indians and people from numerous other non-Western cultures also indicate that they have less free choice in their lives compared with North Americans. Choices do not appear to play as large a part in the lives of Asian Indians as North Americans. <clears throat> in learned helplessness, an individual feels that he or she is unable to control or avoid unpleasant events, and the person will suffer from stress and potentially depression. A study by Odingen and Seligman in 1990 found that East Berliners showed more signs of learned helplessness than the people on the other side of the wall in West Germany. Now, the weird part was that uh, Berlin was in the middle of East Germany, uh, so the West Berliners couldn't go anywhere. They, could, they, only, they were only able to, to uh, survive in West Berlin. East Germans, or East Berliners, of course, could go anywhere in East Germany. They had free access to the entire country, but not the West Berliners. They were surrounded by East Berlin. Yet the East Berliners felt more learned helplessness than the people in West Berlin. Snibby and Marcus in 2005 argue that upper middle class Americans are raised to favor choices and to express themselves through their choices. They learn to respond quite negatively when they believe that they do not have any choice in a situation. Working class Americans grow up learning that much of what people encounter in life is beyond their control, an external uh, foc locus of control, and that a good way of, uh, to maintain one's independence is to emphasize one's integrity and resilience during tough times. And that's working class Americans. But Ash's work in 1962 showed that Americans were more likely to conform to social pressure than not. 75% of Ash's American uh, subjects conformed on at least one of the 12 trials. Conformity is common, and this is what he did. Um, uh, Ash had a, a group of students uh, look at something, and they had to agree on on on. Uh, which one was longer, which one was bigger. Uh, and uh, everybody was a confederate except one individual. What they were trying to do, they were trying to see if that individual would conform. And in this picture, this is the guy that uh, uh, they are testing to see if he will conform. Well, they, um, according to, uh, well, you know, the, the research had to do with 12 different trials, and they were trying to see if they could force this guy to conform with everybody else's. They were obviously... Uh, everyone else's uh, its choices were obviously incorrect, uh, and they were trying to force this individual to conform, and they did 12 trials with each of these individuals. And what they discovered was that 75% of, Amer of uh, American subjects conformed to at least one of the 12 trials. Conformity is very common in the United States. Ash conducted other experiments dealing with conformity and found that there are several consequences to not conforming. And this is one of the reasons why, and if you think about your own uh, time in high school, uh, why there were so many people that, that uh, wore the same clothes and cut their hair in the same way everybody else did, they were conforming. So what happens to somebody when they don't conform? Well, one of the problems is that people might laugh at them. Another problem is that people tend to actively dislike those who won't conform. So the idea is that in order for us to get along with everybody else, we have to conform. Well, what if somebody is is gay? Uh, that is 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 very uncommon. It's or it's not very uncommon, but is relatively uncommon. So if somebody is gay in high school, what's the probability that they are going to state their uh, sexual preference in high school? The reality is that most people try to conform. Uh, so th potentially what would happen is they wouldn't say anything about it in high school, and then when they get out in a larger society where they blend in better with everybody, and there's no co 
conforming because uh, high school is a, is a, a, a closed system of a select number of people. If somebody is gay, uh, after they, they can declare that e much, much easier uh, after they uh, get out of high school when their, the group, their group of people that they're around are, are, is not as confined as it is in high school. Meta-analysis of conformity studies shows that while Americans show a great deal of conformity, people from collectivistic cultures conform even more, especially when they are conforming to their in-groups. And this is according to Bond and Smith in 1996. And that is the end of this chapter, I believe. Yes, it is. Okay. That's the end of this chapter. Okay, so we need to talk about the papers that you're supposed to do. Uh, they're due in a month. Uh, what I want you to do is to read about another culture. I want you to read about another culture, and I need. I want you to... Specifically, what I want you to do... <laughs> this music's driving me crazy. Okay. Specifically, what I want you to do is read a novel about another country. And a lot of times, you pick up more cultural ideas from a novel than you do with anybody else. Uh, those of you who are um, uh, have been in the military... These are not Americans. These are Brits. And you can tell by the way they move their arms. See, see how they they've got their thumbs stuck in, and they're they they've got their arm. They've got all this arm movement going on. Yeah, these are these are all Brits, um, and they're all soccer players. Look at their legs. Look how strong their legs are. They're all, they they're all soccer players. Okay, okay. So my point is, uh, what I want you to do is I want you to, to read about another culture, and I want you to compare that culture with the Diné culture. Uh, of course, you've taken all these classes in, in Diné culture, um, and uh, you've got all this knowledge about Diné culture, but I, I believe that the strongest way of uh, understanding your own culture is to compare it to another culture. So what I want you to do is I want you to read a book about another culture, from another culture. And there are a bunch of them out there. If you have any problems selecting them, uh, you know, I normally when when I'm on campus, uh, I lend out my books. I've got lots of books about a lot of different cultures. Um, it can it has to be another culture. It can't be the Diné culture. Uh, it can be another. It can be another uh, native culture. Um, if you can if you can figure that out. Uh, it can be, you know, Japan, it can be China, it can be Korea, it can be, you know, K-pop, J-pop, whatever. Um, it, it, it can be, it, it, it just needs to be another culture, all right? The Canadian culture is different than the United States, than the Diné culture, certainly. But it can't be the white culture in the United States, it can be the cowboy culture, it can be the drug culture, it can be, you know, it can be any any different culture. So that's what I want you to do. I, I want you to read about another culture. I, I think that's really important. So um, if you if you have any questions about this, if you can't find something, if you if you uh, a lot of people have done Mongolia for some reason. There's a really good book about Mongolia. Um, and uh, I, you know, potentially I'll, I uh, will get a book to you. Uh, you can go to the library and find something. Uh, you just need to read a book about another culture. Um, I, I was an English major. Uh, my bachelor's degree is in English. And this is one of the reasons why I want you to read a book. You guys read so little, you, you know, you just watch television and, and whatnot. Anyway, so there you go. Uh, one of the things, what did I see? Oh, you know, uh, if you've seen the movie The Great Wall with, uh, with Matt Damon, uh, those creatures, um, those creatures that uh, they were fighting against, uh, I've seen those guys before. Um, when we were in uh, Japan, uh, they had floats, and on those floats were those green monsters. Uh, so that is a traditional monster. What did they? I can't remember what they called them now. I looked them up. Anyway, uh, we saw them on those floats, the Japanese floats, the Buddhist floats. It was a Buddhist. Uh, it was a Buddhist uh, parade. Anyway, okay. So that's what I want you to do. I want you to read about another culture. Uh, that you don't have to have five uh, references. 
Uh, just the one is, is enough, the book that you're talking about. So there you go. I just want you to read about uh, another culture and compare it with the Diné culture. So uh, stay safe. Uh, we'll see you later. I wish I were there so that I could lend you guys my, my books, but I'm not there. My books are still there, actually. They're in my office. Uh, but uh, catching somebody in my off or, or catching somebody in the fob uh, is probably almost impossible. Um, uh, Jeremiah's got my uh, Jeremiah has my uh, my uh, code to my door, so he's he would be able to break in. But catching Jeremiah there would probably be uh, you know uh, Professor Barber there would be probably almost impossible. Anyway, okay, so have a good day. I have to go to a soccer game. My grandson is playing at one o'clock and it's noon and it's about 45 minutes away. So uh, stay safe and I'll see you next time. Uh.